When you order a QSIS Core or I.O. frame from QSC, you can use the online configurator to have your device custom built or CTO to your desired I.O. card configuration. However, if you need to order a core or a frame that is not configured to order, or if you're upgrading an existing device with new I.O. cards, this video will show you how to properly install an I.O. card into that unit. If you order a new non-CTO device and take the lid off, it should look something like this. Now on I.O. frames and on Core 250i and 500i, you'll notice the empty space for I.O. cards. These units were not designed to run with empty slots. You'll need to install something into every available slot. If you don't intend on using an I.O. card for every slot, you'll need to use a blank card on any remaining slots. Make sure that when you're ordering your I.O. cards from QSC, that you order enough blank cards to completely fill your device. You also want to make sure that you're ordering the right kind of cards, namely Type 1 cards or Type 2 cards. Older QSIS devices use Type 1 cards that use a ZIF connector and a ribbon cable like this one, while the newer cores use Type 2 cards that use a more standard connection. The easiest way to tell if your device is a Type 2 is by looking at the serial number. The first four digits represent the month and year the device is made. See, this one was made in October 2011. If your device has a serial number whose first four numbers start with 0412 or earlier, meaning your device was made in April 2012 or earlier, that means you need to use Type 1 cards. If it starts with 0512 or later, well then you have a Type 2 device. Core 500i and 250i, which can each house 8 I.O. cards, will usually ship with a rear cover plate and no I.O. cards if they're ordered as non-CTO cores, meaning that you intend on installing the cards yourself upon installation at the job site. I.O. frames can house 4 I.O. cards each, and the server cores can house 1 I.O. card each. The server cores will always ship with a blank card if you've not configured them as a particular I.O. card. The first step is preparation. You'll need a screwdriver, some small wire cutters, and an anti-static wrist strap or an anti-static work mat. If you don't have access to either of these, be sure to occasionally ground yourself by touching the chassis to dissipate your static charge, and only handle the circuit boards by the edge. This will provide a minimal static safeguard, but using an anti-static wrist strap is recommended. If you're using a power screwdriver, be sure that it's set on a very low torque setting. Now you're going to remove all 10 screws that attach to the unit's top panel. There will be three screws on each side and four in the back. Remove the cover and set it aside. If you're installing new cards, you will start with the ones that are on the bottom. Your first step, if it's attached, is to remove the faceplate. Each I.O. card will require six screws, four on the top and two to reattach the faceplate. You'll use these short standoff screws that will provide the attachment points for the next card. You can use the empty bit housing on your screwdriver to use these. But remember, if you're using a power screwdriver, make sure you set the driver to the lowest possible torque setting or you run the risk of snapping off the threads. Before you move on, first you'll need to connect your I.O. card to the core using the data cable. Type 2 I.O. cards will use an IDC connector like this. Simply line up the notch on the end piece and push it in until the two levers engage. Then you'll want to attach to the circuit board. Now make sure that you attach it to the correct receptacle. They are labeled to match with your I.O. card slots, B, D, A, and C, which correlate with the four slots that you can see on the back panel. Type 1 cards will have a ZIF connector, that's zero insertion force, which requires you to carefully unlock the brown flap. Now these are really fragile, so be careful not to tug too hard. Insert the ribbon and then lock the brown flap down again. You want the blue side up for this. And be sure the ribbon is straight and fully seated. If you're replacing a bottom card, you would have to remove all of the cards above it first, and then continue installing all the cards and cables until all the slots are filled again. Use the included zip ties to loosely collect the ribbons to the chassis lances. The cables should not be tight or deformed, just enough to keep them from flopping around. If you're working on a Core 250i or 500i, you'll have to tie the ribbon from the GPIO port to the top I.O. card standoff to prevent it from touching the motherboard or the power supply. To do this, you'll have to squeeze the ribbon and slightly deform it. Once you're done with the tie cables, use your wire cutters to snip the loose ends off as close to the buckle as possible to prevent any sharp ends. When you're all done, replace the top panel with the 10 screws that you removed earlier. 
supply power to the unit and wait for it to boot. If you cycle through the display screen, you should receive confirmation that the I.O. cards have been properly installed. If not, remove power and go back inside and double check that all your ribbons are completely secure and that you haven't accidentally dislodged any of the other connections. Thanks for watching.